Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thanks so much for listening to my podcast. If you like what you hear, please follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and also at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thanks so much for listening. Enjoy it. I'm so excited to discuss my sponsor today, which is Page One Books, because my summer book bundle is ready on pageonebooks.com. And the bundle that I've put together includes three books that I picked, uh, Montauk by Nicola Harrison, More Myself by Alicia Keys, and I Miss You When I Blink by Mary Laura Philpott, all of which have been on this podcast here. Uh, It includes a Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books beach tote, a cute little library card pencil slash cosmetic case, and a water bottle for staying hydrated plus a little... um, thing of sun lotion. So go to page1books.com, page one with the number one. So page number one books.com and check out my page one books summer bundle. Buy it as a gift, a housewarming, if you actually go somewhere or just give it to yourself. Everybody needs a treat. We've had a long spring. <laughs> page one books.com. Welcome to day three of my second week of my July book blast. So I guess technically this is day day eight of my July book blast. And <laughs> today is Beach Reads Wednesday. I love Beach Reads. I wish I had more time to just sit on the beach and read, as I'm sure we all do. But instead of that, I'm offering up all these amazing Beach Read books, which you should definitely check out this summer and beyond. Amy Popol grew up in Dallas, Texas. She graduated from Wellesley College and worked as an actress in the Boston area, appearing in a corporate industrial for Polaroid, a commercial for Brooks Pharmacy, oh gosh, I remember Brooks Pharmacy, and a truly terrible episode of America's Most Wanted, along with other TV spots and several plays. While in Boston, she got her MA in teaching from Simmons College. She married a neuroscientist at NYU, and for the past 30 years, they've lived in many cities all over the world, from San Francisco to Berlin, and had three sons. Amy taught high school English in the Washington, D.C. suburbs, and after moving to New York, worked as an assistant director of admissions at an independent school where she had the experience of meeting and getting to know hundreds of applicant families. She attended sessions at the Actors Studio Playwrights Directors Unit and wrote the theatrical version of Small Admissions, which is one of her three novels, which was performed there as a stage reading in 2011. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, The Rumpus, Working Mother, Points in Case, The Belladonna, and Literary Mama. Her novels include Small Admissions, Limelight, and Musical Chairs. Welcome, Amy. Thanks so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Bugs. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me, Zibby. Congratulations on your latest novel, Musical Chairs. So exciting. Can you please tell listeners what this book is about? Absolutely. So I actually just received the hardcover. <gasps> oh, I, look at it. And they're just so pretty. That's always exciting. I mean, I have to say that's even, even three books in. That is such a thrill when your books arrive. This is a book about a woman who is spending the summer at her sort of ramshackle country house in Connecticut. And she's in a piano trio, a classical piano trio with her very best friend in the world, who's a man named Will. And they've hired a new person to be the violinist in their trio. And all they have to do is survive the summer. And they're going to have a new fresh start in the fall. So Bridget goes out to her house in hopes of spending a very romantic three months with this new boyfriend, not sort of sort of a new boyfriend that she has, but it's getting kind of serious. And he breaks up with her over email partly on the advice of his ex-wife, who thinks that maybe they should just take things a little bit more slowly. So that's just kind of a disappointing way for Bridget to start her summer. And from there, her adult kids move back home. Her 90-year-old father announces he's getting married. And it's just a summer of everybody sort of having to rethink and reinvent themselves and figure out how they're going to move forward under changed circumstances. I didn't really like Sterling from the beginning, though, I have to say. I was kind of not upset when they broke up. (laughs) You introduce him as like sending like a read my email right away. And I don't know, I just sort of, I didn't think he really cared enough when she was accidentally electrocuted, like right at the beginning when she first went out to her house. So I don't know. I feel like, you know, things happen for a reason, (laughs) even in fiction. Probably most of us will feel like that was a good riddance situation. But even when you're in those situations, it's sort of hard to see it sometimes for yourself. I mean, I've had a lot of friends and family and serious relationships. And in the moment, it just seems like the worst thing that could possibly happen. But then you sort of rethink. and, And yeah, I think sometimes you come out better for it. And I think in Bridget's case, you're absolutely right. I agree. (laughs) It doesn't make it easier for Bridget, of course. Yeah. She doesn't have the luxury of the distance from us reading about her. (laughs) 
<laughs> or even of her character friends in the novel who can maybe see it for what it is. But anyway, but yes, that's one of many things that she goes through this summer. I love, by the way, how you structured the book, how you had it over a course of a summer with the prelude and then June, July, August and a coda in September. Like that's just so perfect. I love when there are clever structures to books that sort of echo the content. So check plus on that. <laughs> There was one other little structural element that I don't think readers would pick up on necessarily, but it was just something that was important to me in my own brain to kind of work it out. So it's a trio and every series starts with Bridget. You get a chapter from Bridget, you get a chapter from Will, and then there's the empty chair. So that third chapter is filled by Gavin, who is their first ever violinist once in June, once in July, and once in August. But every other third chapter, you get a surprise voice. So it's just sort of, for me, in my head, it was kind of representing Bridget and Will as the two stable anchors in this trio, and that that third seat always is rotating. So I sort of wanted to mirror that in the structure of the book. So it's not something anyone would necessarily see when they were reading, but it was really helpful for me in writing it to kind of have that blank third chapter. See, I thought I was analyzing it and I missed it. (laughs) I'm sorry. (laughs) That overarching structure was exactly what I wanted. I wanted the prelude and I wanted the coda and I wanted the three months in between. And then as a little miniature structure, I put the every three chapters structure in on top of all of that. So no, you got it completely. (laughs) What is the role of music in your life? You obviously know a ton about it. Did you research it for this book? Are you a musician? How did you learn so much about it? Zibby, I cannot read music. I don't understand music and I can't carry a tune, to be honest. I'm a huge appreciator of music. And somehow I raised three children who are very musical and two of them so far are sort of following a career in music. So I got a lot of help from them. My youngest son is a classical pianist and he's studying musicology and composition in college. So he helped me so much. And every time I would sort of have an idea, like I sort of feel like I need them to be listening to something or I need them to be rehearsing something, I would you know, research, go to my son, get somebody to help me. It was a really fun world to dive into, but it was also nerve wracking because I wanted to make sure that I got things right. In an early draft, I think this happens to a lot of writers. In an early draft, I sort of went too far and it was just so infused with music (laughs) that my publisher, my editor said, that's great. Now let's just pull back a little bit for readers who are not classically trained musicians like me. So I feel like there's enough of it in there now to sort of really put you in that world. But if you don't know anything about classical music, That is no hindrance to understanding or reading the book. I would say, though, that there are some nice references to pieces of music that if you have your Spotify nearby while you're reading, it might be fun to plug in some of those titles and composers and take a listen because the stuff that I chose to put in there, the pieces that I chose were selected carefully and they're beautiful. Spotify now has playlists you can make, so you can always just make a playlist. I know. I think it's actually... Really, a really good idea. I think I'm going to sit down and go back through the book and find every piece of music that I referred to and make a playlist. Yeah. Thank you, Tibby. No. It's such a yeah. No problem. I love how you had to interview essentially your own children to get the research done for this book. I mean, it's actually a genius way to bond with your kids, right? Like I'm writing a book about something that I know interests you more than anything. So you're the one who's going to have to help me. Like how that must have made them feel so great. Did it bond you guys in the process? I would think that it it did in a way that you couldn't necessarily get at in another way. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it was really, it's really amazing that you spend so much of your life teaching your children how to do things, tie their shoes, use a spoon, (laughs) any, all of the things that we, manners, all the things that we try to teach our kids. But it is so much fun. The first time this happened to me was I lived in Berlin for two years and when we got there, my kids didn't speak German at all. And I spoke really terrible German, really, really. I, I'm, I can massacre that language like nobody. But when we got there, knowing that my kids, you know, they, were, they went into school, they went into German speaking school and they really struggled. And I was helping and teaching and helping and teaching and helping with their homework. And then all of a sudden that flipped on its head 
and their German was so much better than mine. And I was constantly asking them for help. And we would go into a store and I would say, could you please, can you help me ask this saleswoman this question? And they were suddenly the experts and able to help me. And I just remember thinking, that's what you want as a mom. You want to see your kids get even better, like way better than you at the things that they are, you know, that they excel at and have interest in. So that was a lot of fun, especially with my youngest, Luke, because he's the one who's really the most classically trained and saying to him, like, you are the expert here and I am not, and I need your help. (laughs) And he was very generous with his time, really slowed things down for me. He would read my drafts and he would explain like, that is not what a rehearsal process is like. That is not the way a musician would ask that question. He would even say to me, that sounds like a non-musician trying to talk about music. And I would be like, help me, help me, you know, help me get that so that it sounds right, especially in dialogue, because dialogue is really important to me. So I finally asked my kids for their help again. And we just filmed a book trailer because I'm in Connecticut right now in a house that is somewhat dilapidated, we'll say. And I needed help. It was an all hands on deck kind of project. So the whole family came together and we filmed this book trailer. It should be out, I hope, in about a week. That's exciting. The last hang up, the last holdup of getting this book trailer out in the world is the music. It's always because the, there's certain places where it needs to get louder and it needs to get softer. And my oldest child is a sound engineer. So he's 26 and works in music studios all over New York City. And he's got the file right now and he's doing all of the adjustments to make sure that the sound is right and that the music that's in the background is right. So I am so lucky. I have these experts right in my house. Totally. You should have that. Now you should, you could easily start a podcast, you know, you could just have your son help you with the intro outro music. I mean, you could do like free production. (laughs) Maybe I'll call them. (laughs) He's he's really good. He, (laughs) Hearing in the background music in the book trailer, he kept saying, do you hear that hum? I was like, I don't hear a hum. And he's like, yes, there's this, just listen. And I would listen. It's my old lady ears. I was like, I don't hear a hum. And he's like, I have to take that out. That sounds terrible. (laughs) So I'm happy to have him. (laughs) Oh, that's awesome. I love this part in the book. Speaking of adult children, Bridget is the protagonist of this book. You said, Bridget did not want to get high with her children. She never had, never would. Nevertheless, her feelings were hurt that they hadn't even invited her to join them. (laughs) And then they asked somebody else. And you said, they asked Gwen, they asked Jackie. Bridget would have said no anyway, but they could have at least included her just to be nice. When they came back to the porch talking loudly and laughing uncontrollably, she left them out there and went into the kitchen where all three dogs who were soggy from having waded into the pond twice were underfoot and pacing in search of dropped food. She'd lost control of the evening. (laughs) Has that ever happened? That's such a funny, like I had, I mean, my kids aren't that old, so I haven't thought about what happens when your kids start doing things like that or that you would feel left out or anything like that. Tell me about that scene. Well, and I think there are times when your kids are really little and you think that there are things that could never happen or would never happen. Well, now I, so speaking of life imitating art, I came out here and of course, when quarantine hit, all three of my adult children moved back home. And this was long after I had written the book. The book was submitted ages ago. But here I am for three months now. I've had all three of my kids, 20, 23, and 26. So the twins in the book are 26. And they've all moved back home. And it's just such a funny, on two levels, it's funny to me. Because one, it's just a strange thing that I never thought would happen again. I just didn't think I would ever have a situation where there would be this extended period of time where my kids would be living here. And they both regress sometimes to more child or sort of like what life was like when they were younger. And then at other times, they're so grown up and so mature. And I don't have to take care of them at all. So that's just been funny. And then the fact that it's exactly the situation that happens in the book. So it's just been, it's been really funny. (laughs) Do my kids engage in behaviors that I sometimes don't approve of? Yes, they do. They probably would invite me. I'm just way too anxious a person (laughs) for that to be my drug of choice. So yes, these things, these things happen. These things definitely happen. I wrote a piece that's on a comedy site called The Belladonna, which is hilarious if nobody's ever looked at it. The Belladonna is really a great for women humor site online. And I wrote a piece, I can't quite remember what the number was, but it was like, you know, your growing child. It was sort of like what to expect when you're expecting 
that it was like the 219th trimester and beyond. (laughs) So it was just sort of a humor piece about sort of what to expect when your kids are like 18 and up. And I had a scene in there where, you know, your little tyke might have Tinder date sleepovers. (laughs) Like, what do you do when you walk in and there's a man in boxers in your kitchen making pancakes? (laughs) (laughs) And I wrote that just for fun. And then, I don't know, somehow being here with these three very grown boys slash men has been, it's been really enlightening. <laughs> so, okay. and fun. Yeah. <laughs> you have another character in the book, and I just wanted to read this quote. You said, one of Isabel's biggest flaws she'd be willing to admit was that she was convinced she could straighten out everyone else's life while her own was, to the objective observer, a shit show. So that just spoke to me because, I don't know, I can so relate to always wanting to like have the answer when like I don't necessarily have the answer myself. So is that something that you tend to do as well? Or was this just, um, you've seen this so many times from other people? I think we've all done that. I mean, other people's problems, it's so you're, 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 you have some distance and that distance gives you clarity. And it just can sometimes be so easy to look at somebody else's problems and just be like, I always joke with my husband because he sometimes says, well, you know what you should do? And I said, you should have a podcast called, you know what you should do. (laughs) And I think we all could, because I think we all feel like we have this sense of, I know what you should do. But when it comes to your own situation, it's just always so much more complicated to look at somebody else's, to look, to look at your own problems and sort of sort through what to do. That's why we have friends though, right? That's why we run our problems past other people because they can so often give us a little bit of insight that we somehow miss ourselves because we're too close to the problem. It's the same with writing. The reason that you get beta readers and people, because you get so close to your own material and your own circumstances and your own situation and issues that you just can't see what's really happening anymore. So you give it to somebody else, let them take a look at it. And then they say, you know what you should do? (laughs) I say that all the time, by the way. I say that in like, I don't know probably half the podcast. Like, this is a great idea. You should do that. Like the playlist. I just said that. It's like so obnoxious of me, really. I mean, I don't know what I should do. So, (laughs) but it's the same thing. So I think we all appreciate it because I, especially when when it's friends and experts and people who really know what they're talking about. I mean, who doesn't want to hear sort of a fresh perspective on your own situation? I think it's helpful. Sometimes when I have like a problem, I like I usually write when I'm really upset about something, not for anybody, just like to sort out my own feelings. And I often will say like, pretend that this is a friend's problem. Like, right. what would you say to the friend? And I'm so much more lenient on my friends than on myself, right? And I can see oh, it, yeah. but when it's me, it's so different. So we're so much harder on ourselves. I mean, I, I think that's absolutely true. And I actually think, you know, what you should do would be the great, a great title for a podcast. I think it would be so perfect. And in Isabel's case, she has that sense that she always knows what somebody else should do. But her life really, when you, when you lay it out on paper at that stage of the book, it does not look great. (laughs) I mean, she is really in turmoil and you do find out toward the end of the book, sort of what was the origin of all of this. I also wanted to sort of tap into a little bit of humor for moms when our older kids get really proud of ourselves for something that they've done that they think is very empowering and very wonderful. And we look at it as the mom and we're sort of like, are you sure that was the right thing to do? Are you positive? That was, and in this case, and this isn't a spoiler because it happens quite early on since Isabel has quit a job that was a very good job. And you know how we all feel about good jobs, especially these days. And she just felt she wasn't quite living her best life. And she just quits, burns bridges, just walks out and then says to her mother, I'm so proud of myself right now. And you don't want to say to your kid, well, are you sure you should be proud? Because we're trying to instill confidence. But I think we may have taken that to such a big degree that we somehow have told our kids that they should be proud of almost any step that they take. And that can be trouble. That can be troubling. But I do think in, even in Isabel's case, I think by the time you get to the end of the book, you feel she's probably done the right thing because life is short and we have to put ourselves in, in, if we can, and this is not always the case, but if we can, you know, we don't always ask our kids to think, 
what do you want to wear to work every day? Do you want to be sort of suited up when you go to work or do you want to have a more casual lifestyle? And this is a ridiculous conversation to be having in this day and age where jobs are just so hard to come by. But when I was re- you know, writing the draft of this book, we were in a slightly different era. And I felt like for Bridget, she could look at that and think, you just walked out of a good job. What were you thinking? And Isabel would think, oh, something else will come along. That's a very privileged, <laughs> very, and in fact, Jackie, Jackie says that it's a, that that's a, that they are very privileged kids and that that seeps out of lots of conversation and she sees it. So, (laughs) (laughs) so tell me a little more about your writing process. How long did it take to write musical chairs? Like, where did you write it? Did you write it in the house that you're in now? I know we're on Skype, but in this Connecticut in need of fixing up, although it looks perfectly beautiful to me from what I can see. (laughs) Well, this is a well curated background. (laughs) Around, you'd be like, oh, I did write a lot of the book here. I'm actually just starting Susie Schnell's book, We Came Here to Shine. And I was just listening to her speak about her writing process. And I know we're not comparing ourselves, but it really makes me want to be Susie Schnell. <laughs> so, and Fiona Davis, who writes such beautiful historical fiction, both they, of them. They were both on my podcast too, so we can listen. <laughs> So for anyone who doesn't know, they are both planners. They plan, plan, plan. It's not shocking to people who know me and my personality that I am not a planner. I am not a planner. I go into these books with situations in my head and people in my head. And then it takes me a really long time to figure out who these people are and therefore how. And I know they say, well, we start with drafts and then we throw them out and have to rewrite them as we get to know our characters. That's of course true. But I do wish I could be a little bit more like them and sort of map things out a bit more from the get-go. I did not do that with musical chairs at all. I threw out about 50,000 words of musical chairs in the process of writing it. That's, for people who don't know, easily half a book. And that was actually in one of the major rounds. So it was probably more like 75,000 words if you look at the entire course of writing the book. I just think that's really inefficient I think that writing those scenes that I throw out maybe teaches me something about writing. So maybe it's not a waste of my time, but it is inefficient. So I'm working on a fourth book right now and I have tried to do my version of an outline. It's just rough, but I've sort of given myself a little bit of a shape that I'm trying to follow. So we will talk again in a year, (laughs) let you know if it worked for me, because I don't know how much of this is personality driven, how much of this is work, just your work style, your writing style. I just know that for me, with my first three books, I really figured it all out as I went along. And that's joyful sometimes. It's so much fun sometimes. It's also painful and perhaps really inefficient (laughs) at times. So, you know, there are good sides and bad sides, but I I am going to give the, the Fiona Davis, Jamie Brenner, Susie Schnall outline the old college try this time around. I'm just going to see what happens and we'll, and I'll let you know. Yeah. Keep us posted. <laughs> Avoid throwing out half a book again. I, I would like to do that. I just don't know if it's possible for me. <laughs> we'll, it's, it's, we'll, an, it's an art, not a science. So you'll just play with it and see, you know experiment. I think there's nothing wrong with, I mean, I think in fact, it's, it's a great thing to listen to other writers, hear how they do things, see if you can't pick up on some of their skills and habits and incorporate them into your own process. And I'm definitely up for trying to do that. And if anyone's too rigid and too structured, I would say try being a fly by the seat of your pants, sir, for a little while, because it can be really fun. I think it was Susie who also said that she writes out sort of like diary entry type things from her character's point of view. I sort of feel that I do that as well. I I like to really understand who that person is before I just start. So I think I do a lot more work on the character side and less work on the plot side. And that is fun, but it can get me into trouble. (laughs) That was all great advice. Do you have any advice to aspiring authors in addition to all of that good stuff? I would say just keep at it. Keep trying. Don't be afraid to write something terrible and throw it out. I very much believe in the Anne Lamott advice of just write a terrible first draft. You can't edit until you have something on the page. And don't be afraid. Like no one's going to see it. Don't worry about it. Just write 
a first chapter, let it be awful. It might end up being the 10th chapter. It might end up being in the trash bin. You don't know, but you can't move to the next step until you get that lousy first draft written and finished. And then the second thing, the other piece of advice that I would give, it's sort of two things combined, develop a thick skin or a little bit of a wall between you and the criticism because there's going to be a lot of it. There's going to be a lot of rejection. There's going to be, and you know, figure out who do you trust, whose eyes and sensibility do you really trust and put yourself in that person's hands, whether it's a beta reader, I would not say a family member or best friend, they're going to be too nice to you. Find somebody who's willing to be mean to you and let them read it and don't take it personally and don't say they just don't understand what I was trying to do. If they don't understand what you they were trying to do, there's a problem. So just learn to find people whose sensibility and aesthetic you trust and then take the criticism. I go to bed sometimes for a day after I get a bad editorial letter. You just have to kind of let it wash over you and just accept it. And then you just get back in the chair and you, I mean, resilience is key. (laughs) Get back in the chair, keep going. So yeah, resilience and get that first draft on paper. Just get it down in your laptop in whatever, just get it written. Love it. Thank you, Amy. Thanks so much for sharing your experience and your advice and your stories and the music and all the rest. So thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me and keep reading and doing what you do, Zibby. You're just amazing. And thank you for having me on. Thank you. Bye, Amy. Have a great day. Bye, you too. Bye. I hope you've enjoyed this Beach Read on Beach Reads Wednesday, part of my July book blast. Thanks again for listening to my podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. If you liked this episode, please follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books and sign up for my mailing list at zibbyowens.com so you can always hear about the latest things I'm up to. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much to Page One Books for sponsoring today's episode. I hope you'll all check out my summer beach bundle at pageonebooks.com. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. Thanks for listening. You could always email me at zibby at zibbyowens.com. Thank you.